uh, let's uh, get ready to get started here. Uh, let me introduce Chris. Chris LaPree um, is a, a professor in our department teaching many courses and doing research in paleomagnetism. Oh, he's the sec second uh, paleomagician in two weeks. Also on the Colorado Plateau topic, and you ask why would I have scheduled uh, uh, two on this topic? And the reason why is last week, Dennis uh, told us about the previous core hole and the background for the project. Uh, but Chris is basically in the process of getting the continuation of the Colorado Scientific Drilling Project, CSDP, uh, funded through ICDP. And in that proposal, he's got some exciting new science and where we're going to go. And I thought particularly interesting for people to see some of the plans that we have for drilling. So without further ado, uh, Chris LaPree. Chris, you can just take control anytime you want. Just, uh, you know, share your, your PowerPoint. And can you hear me now? Yep. All right, great. I see the Rutgers Geology logo. Oh, great. Okay. How about now we have that? Our PowerPoint is up. It's not projected, but it's up. Phase two questions, motivations, and objectives is projected. Let's try. Let's try this now. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yeah, but it's not in projection mode. Why is not? Um, hmm. Strange. You should just go be able to go to the the button that you hit. There you go. Oh no, that's back to you. It's not sharing in projection mode. It's just sharing my. Uh, uh, how about if I try this? How about if we do it like that? That's it. Okay, great. All right. So um, thanks to everyone for coming today. And uh, what I thought we'd start with is looking at the Moenkopi formation. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a various different topics today, uh, mostly. Do with the, the the phase two of the drilling project, coring project. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to start off with some some broad questions and then talk a little bit about the motivations and objectives. And this is the Moen copy. This was the the formation that Ken was talking about in the couple of emails that he sent out. And it's a, it's a good place to start because it it kind of embodies all the reasons as uh, why it's necessary to drill on the plateau, why outcrop work is is difficult and and those, those two main reasons are basically um, to, to get better age control on these lithologic units and also to extract uh, detailed paleoenvironmental um, information. Um, the Moen Kopi is uh, it's a bit of a floater. I mean, not exactly, but it's, uh, it, here you can see, uh, so this, this is uh, just west of Lake Powell by the Navajo Bridge. Um, it, this is Bout Krigsman here. This is Michael Rule, Steve Hesselbo, and, and uh, um, uh, Clemens Ulrich here, uh, part of our international collaboration. And the Moen Kopi locally overlies uh, Paleozoic limestones, as you can see here, and it's overlain by the Chin Lee Formation, uh, which sometimes uh, between the two you have this some, something called the Shinarump conglomerate. Uh, sometimes the Shinarump's not there. Um, but anyway, this is a common problem, trying to figure out exactly where these strata lie in time, not just with the Moen Kopi, but other, other units of, of the plateau. Um, and the other problem is, is extracting uh, really detailed paleoenvironmental information. And uh, for this one, um, I'm helped out by the, uh, the, the rent is too damn high guy. And for those of you that remember him, he ran for the governor of New York uh, a few years ago. And, uh, you know, he, on the rent is too damn high premise. And we can apply that here by saying the Moen Kopi is too damn red, meaning that most of our paleo latitude information suggests that it was accumulated at the equator. 
And by virtue of that, it should be much wetter. And when we see this deep red brick color of these Triassic units, we tend to think that they accumulated in arid or, or semi-arid settings. So trying to reconcile its color with its paleo latitude has been difficult, and getting detailed paleoenvironmental information out of these units is, is challenging. Um, you know, uh, organic material doesn't preserve that well because it's highly oxidized. So you know, can't get pollen, can't get bulk uh, organic, uh, bulk organic for isotope analyses. So we have to come up with other ways and trying, trying to sort out these, these paleoenvironmental information. So that, those are the two big reasons for coring. And largely, I'm going to talk about age control and paleoenvironments today. But before we get into that, I wanted to kind of uh, begin our story in this lovely town of uh, St. George in southwestern Utah. This is where we had our CPCP2 uh, drilling uh, workshop last spring, and it's a, it's a great little town. I hear the snowboarding is incredible, and uh, I know firsthand that the beer has not been Mormonized, so it uh, looks like a nice place to, to hang out. It was a nice place to hang out. And they have a wonderful museum, the St. George Discovery Site Museum. This is the proprietor, Andrew Milner, um, who showed us around the place, very gracious uh, host let us to see all the behind the scenes things. Uh, so, for example, these are some phytosaurs. These are like uh, Eusekodont like crocodilia forms that they were uh, removing the matrix from. They have a wonderful collection of very detailed fossils, fish, and uh, small little footprints, and uh, of course, vegetation. And uh, also, they have some familiar friends that we have in New Jersey, right? Here's uh, Browder footprints or, or Coelophysis uh, footprints, which New Jersey is, is also famous for, especially the Rutgers uh, Geology Museum, right? So they have uh, Growler or Coelophysis out west here, right? And uh, they also have Eubrontes gigantis, which we also have in New Jersey. This isn't from uh, St. George, this is from Tuba, outside of Tuba City in Arizona. And Eubrontes is a uh, ichnophasis that probably is, uh, was made by a dilophosaur or some other uh, large theropod. So these are early theropods that came in at the end of the Triassic, beginning of the Jurassic, some of the first theropod taxa. And this is a really interesting, you know, first order issue uh, looking at these Triassic deposits. You have this large stretch of Pangaea going from New Jersey here to the east to the Colorado Plateau to the west, and you have a, a a, an amazing similarity in taxonomic assemblages. And so the question becomes what, you know, what causes this sort of thing? Are we looking at like large swaths of monsoonal ecosystems like we see in Africa where, you know, that, that promotes corridors for large mammal uh, migrations, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like we see with elephants and other uh, savanna ecosystems in, in Africa? Or does this say something about the incredible adaptability of these early theropods, uh, you know, their, their behavioral modifications and their physical uh, adeptness at negotiating these different environments, you know, especially leading up to these large sand seas represented by the Navajo sandstone like we see here uh, in Zion. Um, in any event, right, so the Triassic period is often considered to be the, the to lay down the blueprint uh, for modern ecosystems uh, in terms of community structure and food web. Uh, you know, and this all took place in a large landmass with a monsoonal climate, right? And if we asked our primate cousins, we say, that sounds really familiar, right? What other, you know, uh, highly uh, adaptable, successful tetrapod uh, taxa evolved within a large continental landmass with a monsoon? So, so I'm probably best known in my research for, for dating the, the, the earliest appearance of, of human behavior. And of, uh, of course that took place in Africa. So, um, but my fundamental question as a scientist is kind of to ask, you know, what causes macro evolution? And, you know, this, um, this opportunity to study the, the Colorado Plateau and kind of compare it to what's going on with, uh, with East Africa, you know, Let's me address these, these sorts of questions. But, uh, but anyway, I digress. Let's move on to some more sciencey things. Um, in any event, so those are, those are kind of my big overall questions. I don't know if they'll ever be able to be answered, but those are kind of my, uh, my big questions I have with the paleobiology. 
But in terms of the project, what we're trying to do, uh, our motivations for CPCP phase two is that I, I'd say we can boil it down to three uh, major motivations. And you know, this includes constructing a time scale for the, uh, the, uh, the late Triassic and the Jurassic and testing these proposed calibrations of the North Hartford astronomical chronostratigraphic polarity time scale. Um, and that's something I'm uh, tangentially involved with um, I'm very interested in understanding the causes of biotic change, such as at the end Triassic extinction and the Adamenian Revolkian biotic change of the late Triassic and possible lengths of bolide impact and, and volcanism. And of course, one of the things that everyone's interested in on this project is looking at perturbations to the, to the global carbon or, or the uh, atmosphere carbon regime um, and also how this impacts or, or feeds into changes the Pangean uh, monsoon. So there's, there's a lot of people working on this project, right? We have uh, a number of international collaborators, uh, some of them I mentioned before, and then also we have a, a number of uh, domestic collaborators working in various uh, groups. Uh, you know, we have a magnetostratigraphy breakout group, a paleobiology breakout group, and, and this is kind of the paleoenvironmental modeling breakout group. Um, uh, Mark Chandler and uh, Linda Soule at uh, uh, NASA GIFs, uh, Selena Suarez uh, at the University of Arkansas, uh, uh, Tamo Reichelt at the UConn, and of course, everyone knows uh, good old Morgan Schaller at RPI. And then we have uh, oops, international collaborators, uh, Jessica Whiteside, Asia, if you remember, she came to Rutgers last fall and gave a talk, and, and Michael Brule. And so far, working with mostly Morgan, Mark, Tamo, Selena, and Linda, we've developed some, some questions uh, about the, the monsoon and also uh, the carbon cycle and how we can uh, integrate this with, with CPCP2. Um, <clears throat> so just to, just to refresh your memory, um, this was a, a, based on a paper that Morgan published, and also I think uh, Jim Wright was on that paper too, and Dennis. Um, I can't remember if Paul was on that paper or not, but uh, this was a paper published in 2015, uh, and this was based off of Morgan's work on the North Basin, looking at uh, uh, atmospheric carbon changes uh, based on paleosol carbonates. And uh, this is an important record because it represents the, the early Mesozoic uh, atmospheric CO2 zenith, right? So it's the largest concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that we've known for the last 200 million years or so. Um, and we don't understand anything from Western Pangaea or the Colorado Plateau in terms of atmospheric uh, carbon, right? So there's virtually no records or, or the records are very poorly constrained in time or uh, they're not uh, very detailed in terms of how much stratigraphic space that they cover. They certainly don't cover the big events, important events like uh, the ETE or the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. So we don't we, we have a very good idea of what's going on in the eastern portion of Pangaea, or I should say Laurentia here. Um, but the western part is largely unknown. There's there's very little data. Um, so this is the overall kind of picture here in the upper part of the of the diagram and in the lower part this is the more nuanced or the or the you know the second order changes in the curve and a lot of this second order that you see beginning in the in the late triassic going into the the jurassic here uh, this drawdown has uh, been hypothesized to be caused by uh, continental weathering rates um, <clears throat> and that's ultimately linked to the climate and also the pandemic positioning of Pangea within certain tropical zones. Well, to test that hypothesis, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to understand how, you know, widespread climate similarities were between uh, the Colorado Plateau and, and the North Basin, for example, in the east here. Uh, also, we need paleo latitudinal da data to address these issues and, uh, you know, sort of, sort of get a broader longitudinal picture of, of the, the climate and the monsoonal interaction, how this may relate to the, the carbon cycle. So that's 
so that's one of the big uh, uh, emphasis of our project. Um, another another question is, well, what about the early Jurassic, right? So we know we have large uh, eruptive events that go on in the early Jurassic. Uh, the Karoo Farrar uh, down here in southern Gondwana uh, has been purported to be the cause of the Toarshian uh, Oceanic Anoxic event. Uh, and, and linking that, uh, linking that uh, anoxic event to these uh, to these eruptions down here, have been largely been done through an, uh, examinations of marine cores. Uh, but there's very little evidence of what's going on uh, on the land at the at the same time that these eruptions are taking place. Uh, you know, and that that would be uh, another reason why the Colorado Plateau would come into play here. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at some of these marine records in detail here, uh, this was a paper that was recently published in PNAS. Uh, Marissa Storm was the lead author, but uh, you know, there's a lot of familiar faces who've been working on this problem. And these marine records, mostly from in and around uh, Europe and adjacent areas, um, they, they tend to be very highly detailed in terms of their uh, in their carbon records, right? They can sample down to the centimeter or sometimes even the millimeter level, and they get very detailed changes occurring during the Plisbachian or the Taurusian here. Um, so Karoo Farrar up here, uh, the Taurusian oceanic anoxic event up here, uh, camp down there. So they get these very long and these very detailed records, and they're very uh, amenable to cyclostratigraphy or, or astronomical calibration, looking at the Milankovitch cycles that are preserved by these carbon isotope oscillations here. Um, but they usually don't have great age control. Uh, it's very difficult to get a, a detailed magnetostratigraphy out of these cores, uh, especially this, so this would be like uh, the Mocris or, or Prius or, or JET project. I don't know what their, uh, the, the name of the project has kind of been changing uh, since it started, but, um, but this is from the Mocris core here. And getting a detailed uh, magnetostratigraphy or even some sort of numeric age control has been difficult. Um, they're, they're effectively black shales or sapropels, right? The, which is not really friendly to the preservation of, uh, of our magnetic um, iron oxides. So they have really great records in terms of what the carbon cycle is doing, really great Milankovitch records, but their age control is, is a bit lacking. And as I said before, this is a, a marine record, um, but what's going on in the terrestrial environment? That's you know, an important place. That's where we live. That's where uh, a large amount of Earth's biota has evolved. And there's a couple of uh, models out there that try to explain the impact of these, these large um, uh, eruptions like Karoo Farrar. Uh, so this is a model for the Taurusian here. Uh, you know, a runaway greenhouse effect about this massive injection of, of CO2 into the atmosphere that, uh, that basically, uh, you know, Soon, and the expansion of um, of continental lake basins, especially in the tropics and the subtropics. Um, but what would happen, let's say, on the Colorado Plateau in these largely uh, fluvial and floodplain environments? What sort of responses would we expect to see? How would this alter the ecosystem, or how would this alter the impacts of the monsoon? on these, these river and floodplain ecosystems. And that's something that's a huge gap uh, in our knowledge. Um, and this is one of the proposed coring sites. This is at Gold Spring, Arizona here. Um, and uh, we're basically standing more or less at the level of the, the Navajo sandstone and walking uh, downward through the section. So, so coring, drilling in this area here will help us address to, to you know, fill in these gaps of trying to understand what what these terrestrial environments, how these terrestrial environments may have responded to these perturbations. So, so that's kind of our, our motivation for, for doing this work, for you know, improving time scale, uh, you know, uh, looking at these big biotic events and then trying to understand how the, the carbon cycle was perturbed by, by um, eruptions, for example. Um, and 
So I just wanted to finish up by talking about some of the specific objections, uh, objections objectives that we have, and then uh, also talk about some of the work that, that I've been doing on CPCP1 and what uh, I hope to be doing on uh, CPCP2, right? So what we're proposing is to, is to obtain three scientific drill cores from the Colorado Plateau. Um, and my particular piece of the puzzle will be to, to help generate environmental proxy records and uh, help to uh, resol resolve any time scale uh, discrepancies by looking at the, uh, the astrochronology of hematite variations within these, these uh, Colorado Plateau um, red beds. And uh, th there's other objectives, not, you know, uh, broader impact objectives that we have too, uh, things like uh, to reciprocate knowledge with uh, Navajo student citizens. Uh, in fact, this summer, I'm going to be mentoring a, uh, a Navajo student on uh, hematite in the, in the Chinle Corps. Um, and also what we're proposing is to have a field school on the Colorado Plateau. And that's in conjunction with the University of uh, Arkansas and uh, Selena Suarez at the University of Arkansas and Randy Ermis at the Utah Natural History Museum. And what we're going to try to do is get uh, a couple students from each of our universities to participate and hopefully uh, get them funding that's going to uh, subsidize costs. So it's not going to be totally free what we're proposing, but we're going to try to reduce the cost greatly. And then, uh, and of course, for our department, we're gonna we're gonna get some funding for master students to work on these two problems of environmental proxies and uh, uh, and the astrochronology from the hematite. This is uh, this is a figure from our ICDP proposal, and and here's all the uh, uh, the people involved on this proposal here. Um, and here's the map of the Colorado Plateau outlined in kind of this gray stipple here. Um, and uh, this is where the CPCP1 was in the Petrified Forest National Park of Arizona. And that's where the two core sites were, uh, Petrified Forest. Um, this is uh, the main objective site. Uh, this is Gold Spring. Uh, this is Round Rock up here to the northeast in Arizona. And this is Sand Mountain in southwest uh, Utah. Um, Round Rock should have uh, uh, the ETE or N Triassic extinction. Uh, Gold Spring, we're hoping to get um, <clears throat> the ETE and also up into the Jurassic, uh, hopefully covering the Coercian. And Sand Mountain is next to the or near adjacent to the dinosaur uh, discovery site. So that's where a good site where a lot of fossils have found. And this is kind of part of a larger coring transect across Pangaea. Um, so location of the Colorado Plateau here in the lower left. Um, so the Colorado Plateau, we have really good magnetostratigraphy. We have uh, really good detrital zircon ages, um, but we don't have a carbon cycle with, uh, information. We don't have an astrochronology. Um, in the North Basin, of course, has, has really great uh, magnetostratigraphy and astrochronology, no detrital zircon ages. Um, the JET project or MOCRIS or Prius um, has really great information on the carbon cycle, um, but their, their age control isn't, uh, isn't, you know, they have very few numerical uh, tie points, mostly from osmium uh, isotope dating, um, and the magnetostratigraphy is, is not the best. And then the Jungar base and its role in this project is, is hopefully that's to get a high latitude to get the, the obliquity signal um, in order for figuring out uh, astronomical chaos, um, something that Dennis talked about uh, last week. So, so this is part of a larger coring project, Transec. That's, that's one of the rationales uh, behind this. And so this is just gives you an idea of the, of the stratigraphic uh, distribution of the deposits that we're looking at. Uh, on the left, this is the Colorado Plateau Coring Project 1, the first phase here. And the idea is that we're, we're not going to try to duplicate the core that we pulled out of the Petrified Forest National Park, but, but to overlap with it, uh, specifically the upper part of the, the CPCP1 core. And, and this is the Gold Spring uh, coring site here, uh, Moen Kopi down here, which I talked about before. And um, 
ideally, like what we what we hope to get a uh, a core through would be somewhere in the Carnian, going through the Norian, all the way up into the Laurentian here, um, and therefore would be covering uh, you know these uh, large eruptive events like Kru Farrar and Camp, uh, the End Triassic extinction, uh, uh, other events like the Matakwagan impact structure. Um, and then the uh, the Adamanian Revoltian uh, faunal turnover, which is temporally coincident with the with the impact. Um, anyway, that, that would be the, the goal um, if uh, if everything goes well. This is the the Gold Spring uh, proposed coring site here, right? And you can see the beds are are, are nearly flat lying um, out in the distance this is the float of the the navajo sandstone that we see here kind of mantling the landscape um, and in some places these uh like i said before these are largely fluvial uh, uh channel and floodplain deposits uh, but when you do get into the fine-grained facies which tend to be predominated by by paleosols um, you do get some well-developed bedded cyclicity um, and you can see this in the um like right here, for example, these little uh, kind of avalanches or alluvial fans on the outcrops, that kind of uh, you know, it's differential weathering of the more indurated, finer uh, grain variants of the facies and the, and, and the coarser, you know, making like a ledge right here, these very, they're like decimeter scale to centimeter scale, finding upward cycles uh, in here. Um, but a lot of times these things are, are predominated by these these large uh, uh, channel bodies that run through and kind of, you know, they're not good for paleomagnetism, obviously. Um, they're, they you know, disrupt the cyclostratigraphy. And so the question becomes, how do we extract good paleoenvironmental information from these strata? Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, oxidation, obviously they're red, they're oxidized, totally kills uh, a lot of the, the organics that's preserved in here, so it's difficult to get pollen or both um, organics. And the cyclicity is not as well developed as we see in uh, to the east here, of course, in, in the North Basin, where the, the facies provide not only uh, a, a record of Milankovitch scale cyclicity ranging from, uh, you know, the, the precession cycle uh, all the way up to, to million year modulating cycles, uh, you know, of course, well documented by, by Paul Olson and, and Dennis. Um, and then also the overall, the changing latitudes of Pangea, these, these spaces, these report. So as Pangea drifts northward, you know, you get a change in the dominant uh, assemblages signaling uh, shifts between more humid equatorial climates to the drier, semi-arid, uh, arid, subtropical climates. So what's, what's going to be our comparable data looking to the west here on the on the Colorado Plateau? And one method that I've been developing that uh, that seems to have some success is looking at the hematite itself in these in these red beds. Um, and you're probably all familiar that there's two phases of, of hematite, right? There's something that's called specularite, which is this you know the the common black uh, mineral. You know, it has an igneous or metamorphic origin. But the, the other phase, the phase that I'm looking at is, uh, I'm trying to coin a term here, pigmentite. Uh, I don't know if the community is going to accept it or not, but I figured there should be a, a, a complement to specularite. Um, so this other phase of, of hematite, which I call pigmentite, gives the uh, pigmentary colorization to these red beds. Uh, it's often finer grain as compared to the specular right. Um, sometimes it's uh, it's non-magnetic because it's very fine grain. Um, so the specular right doesn't contribute to color at all, but but it's not these these grains are too coarse to be involved with paleomagnetism. But uh, finer grains of the specular right variety um, contribute to the to the paleomagnetism of the red beds. Um, and the the pigmentite is strongly related to desiccation events during the seasonal uh, cycle of the monsoon. The concentration of pigmentite within these red beds, but also their, their grain size, which is uh, somewhat related to their color. 
So this is a diffuse reflectance spectroscopy here. This is looking at the characteristic wavelength bands of the pigment type in the, in the Chinle core here that we've retrieved from CPCT1. And one of the trends that you can see is that the, uh, the characteristic wavelength band of the pigment type changes from about 580 or 570 nanometers down here. Um, and as you go upward, it gets to almost exclusively about Five, uh, you know, 535, 540 uh, nanometers or so. And this is a reflection of the changing uh, color of the pigment type from predominantly uh, red, purple, and, and, and blue down here to almost exclusively um, red up here. Like I said, that, that has relationships with grain size, the, the color of the pigment type, and also it's an indicator of climate. Um, so the the climate is getting more arid as we move from the basal portion of the Chinle to the to the upper part here. Um, and this is the, the concentration record from the pigmentite here in the middle. Um, on the left, this is Morgan's uh, atmospheric uh, uh, PCO2 record from both the Chinle and also the, the, the North Hartford Basin. And on the right, this is an outcrop record of mean annual rainfall um, based on uh, geochemical analyses of, of paleosols. This was done by the, uh, the Baylor group, Baylor University, led by uh, Nort. Um, and, and this is our, our pigmentite record in the middle here. And you can see there's some similarities between the, the mean annual uh, precipitation record here from the outcrop and our pigmentite from the core. Cycle-like oscillations begin at nearly the same stratigraphic level or front of stratigraphic level around 214, 215 million years ago. Uh, the monsoon is trending more arid in both records after this, this time datum here. And it also coincides with this, uh, this drawdown in PCO2 that, that Morgan documented. Um, so what, what we're interpreting from this is that the, the pigmentite is an excellent indicator of, uh, of monsoonal climate changes. And, and we're, this is a paper that we have in revision right now. And uh, we're making arguments about that there's really no change when the Manic Wagon, uh, you know, has no impact on the monsoon here. And that uh, perhaps we see biotic changeovers that are coinciding with this changeover in aridity and increased, increased cyclicity uh, uh, for, the, for the monsoon of Western Pangaea. So the other thing I'm looking at with this is the, the hematite cyclicity um, and trying to relate that to astronomical parameters. And this is a simple kind of uh, back of the napkin calculation here, uh, fast Fourier transform uh, analysis. Uh, you know, most of, the, most of the cyclicity that we see in the hematite can be accommodated between cycles that are about uh, 10 to 20 uh, meters in thickness, right? So on average, it's about uh, 13 meters uh, per hematite cycle that we see. And if we just use a, a simple uh, sedimentation rate uh, for the Chinle core that was, that, you know, was determined, this is what Dennis talked about last week in our, uh, what we published. Um, so if we just use a simple sedimentation rate of 34 meters per million years, that comes out to about each 13 meter cycle is about 382 uh, cycles per year. Or, excuse me, 382,000 uh, year cycle, right? Which is 12, 405 uh, uh, eccentricity cycle, right? And this is related to the, uh, to the, um, uh, to the mass of uh, Jupiter and also Venus and, and uh, it's the most metronomic of the, of, the, of the cycles, meaning it's the most stable um, that we have. So, in traditional cyclostratigraphy, when you find something like this, what you would do is you would tune your record to this 13 meter cycle. You would assume that it's the 405 eccentricity cycle. And then all your other cycles would, would tune according to the, to the temporal duration, duration of this 13 meter cycle here, right? Um, but this can get you into trouble, right? If you just use one cycle, you're putting a lot of assumptions just on this on this 13 meter that it's actually correct. It's actually the 405, and this is this was one of the sources of the, the Latimer controversy, right? They they looked at the Latimer uh, platforms and they said they, 
they found what they thought was the procession cycle, and they tuned uh, the Latimer uh, sequence to this one procession cycle, and it turns out that they picked the wrong cycle. And the way this was resolved is that Stephen Myers developed this method called average spectral misfit. And instead of tuning your record to one astronomical cycle, what you do is you tune your record to several cycles at, at once, um, and uh, you find the best uh, sedimentation rate that explains all the cyclicity. You compare that to a, a set of, of known cycles up here, and then it also generates a, a uh, a significance of the correlation between your, your unknowns and your knowns. And, and this is effectively how the Latimer controversy was resolved, right? So Myers uh, tunes uh, the sequence to, to, to multiple cycles within the Latimer. Um, and so this is a more robust method, meaning that you're using more cycles uh, instead of one. And uh, also, what you may not know is that, so the Latimer is a limestone platform, but it's the cycles are actually defined by paleosol. And so we're dealing with a paleosol record with the Chin Li. So, so we're using a more robust method that, that was proven to be effective on, on paleosol cycles. And, and when we use the, the ASM or average spectral misfit method, what we see is we get a sedimentation rate of about 3.1 centimeters per thousand years, which is, uh, which is about 10% off from what was determined from the magnetostratigraphy and the, z the striatal zircons. And uh, our ASM analysis tells us that the, it's not a 13 meter cycle, but a 12.6, so it's pretty, pretty close. And using the, the 3.1 centimeters per thousand year sedimentation rate, it comes out to be about 407. Uh, kilo-year cycle, which is pretty darn close to uh, the 405 cycle, right? So, so this would be one bit of evidence to suggest that we, we have, uh, th that these fluctuations of the hematite are indeed induced by, by astronomical climate change. Let me try something a little bit harder. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a controversy in the lower part of our core here. There's a disagreement between the magnetostratigraphy dating of the core and the detrital zircon date, right? So the detrital zircon date suggests a sedimentation rate that's about, um, about two and a half times faster than the, than the magnetostratigraphy, right? And so the, the yellow represents a, a Bayesian age model through the detrital zircon dates. The, the red ones are considered to be the, the, the more um, robust detrital zircons and the, and the blue are kind of ancillary or, or uh, preliminary dates, right? And, and the broken line here, this is the magnetostratigraphy sedimentation, right? So there's an offset and this is, it has been suggested that this, that this offset here would indicate that there might be some sort of stratigraphic break in the section, kind of like in the middle part of the Suncilla member. So we can use average, average spectral misfit again to try to see if we can resolve some of this discrepancy between the, the magnetostratigraphy sedimentation rates and the detrital uh, zircon ages. So in this case, however, for the lower part of the core, um, we don't have as pronounced cyclicity. And, and the reason for this is because the, the climate was, was wetter in the lower part of the Chinle formation. So in the Mesa Redondo, um, the Blue Mesa and the lower part of the Suncilla, the, 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 the monsoon was um, subhumid to humid. And in the upper part of the Suncilla petrified Mars, uh, forest member and the Al Rock member, you're more of an arid, semi-arid in uh, monsoon. The pigmentite is strongly dependent on desiccation and therefore aridity. So when the climate's wetter down here in, in, in these members, uh, you don't get as strong as a pigmentite signal. So therefore, only, you can only resolve two astronomical cycles. So it's, it's not as, a, it's not as a, 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 a robust analysis as the previous one I showed you, but, but we're still going to give it a shot here. And when we use ASM or average spectral misfit, we get a sedimentation rate of about uh, 1.44 centimeters per thousand years based on these two cycles. And the mag strat sedimentation rate through this interval here, that's about 87 uh, meters thick, uh, the mag strat sed rate resolves to about 13 uh, meters per million years, and ours is about 14 meters per million years. So it's pretty good agreement between the two sedimentation rates again. Um, and 
and that would suggest that there's a number of reasons why he might be wrong. Lead loss, um, also uh, recycling through sedimentary processes. Uh, we, we actually have a paper in geochronology, uh, uh, lead authored by uh, George Gerrels, that discusses some of these problems, and also a paper coming out in the bulletin, GSA bulletin, that talks about this. Um, so anyway, um, what, what I'm trying to sell here is that, you know, for decades, the, the red bed hematite has been uh, considered kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a late diagenetic phase of the strata. And I think there's a growing evidence that this, this pigmentary phase here is, uh, you know, it is indeed in indicative of the late Triassic. Um, you know, I think at this point, people are, are willing very much so to concede that the specular right in these red beds are, are faithful recorders of the paleomagnetic field. Um, but th there's, um, there's less acceptance that this pigmentary phase. Um, and, and in fact, there's evidence, strong evidence to suggest that most of the overprint in these red beds is carried by the pigmentary phase. However, we don't know if the pigmentary phase can carry any of the, the characteristic uh, remnant magnetization. And one of the problems with that is that the unblocking temperatures between the specularite and the pigmentite are, are very close, especially when you get into uh, you know, a temperature range of about 600 to 650 uh, degrees centigrade. Um, but you know, perhaps by looking at individual grains, like what they're doing with these quantum diamond uh, magnetometers, we can start seeing if there are any uh, pigmentite phases that are indeed indicative of, of triassic paleomagnetism. Um, so that's, that's kind of it for me. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of thank uh, everyone on the project here. This is not a small project by any means. Thank, thank Paul and Dennis, of course, for, for, for getting this organized. Um, and right now we're waiting to hear about our ICDP funding, um, and we're in the process of getting a NSF together. And all we have to do then is, is retrieve the cores and and do the science. And so, um, <clears throat> so yeah. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, to take them. Thank you, Chris. That was a good overview. Uh, oh, questions from everybody attending? So I didn't, I just, go ahead. Anybody click in? I, I just wanted to give uh, one quick update on the JET uh, project, the um, which is the Jurassic Earth Time project. Uh, it was originally scheduled to drill, redrill the Mokris borehole in Wales. And uh, two years ago, we were denied permission at the last moment. So it has been moved to Priest, England, which is just across the border from Wales. And we were supposed to spud in in March uh, for the actual coring, so March, April. They were supposed to mobilize in, in March and April and actually spud in late April. Of course, that's been on, put on hold. Uh, but there is some discussion from Steve Hesselbo that it still may happen this summer. So we may or may not have a talk from Jim Browning or me on that in this series um, as we ch uh, continue to check on the updates. But that project uh, was funded in, by both NERC and ICDP. So Chris, you're waiting to hear from ICDP? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's the kind of, we're in a holding pattern and, and we're getting together uh, preparation. We're getting together an NSF with the the positive mental state that the ICDP proposal is going to be funded. So. We, should, we should hear soon about the ICDP results. I know the SAG didn't meet uh, electronically, the science advisory group, and so it's merely a matter of when they're getting the executive committee together, and it's usually in May. So I assume that you'll be hearing in the next two, three weeks, just as a... Uh, Valt Krigsman is on the ICDP uh, board, uh, and he was he was saying that uh, you know he's surprised that we haven't heard already. He, he you know he's uh, he's part of our project. He recu recused himself, of course, from the uh, when they discussed our project. But he was saying, yeah, everything's pretty much done. I'm not sure why they haven't reported back yet. But Steve was telling us that the uh, that the core was moved 
the Prius was moved to Prius because there was some sort of endangered lizard or butterfly on on the farm, the original drill site. So, so the Macris farm is actually now a camp. Uh, you know, like you, you go there and camp out. And it's the same family that's running. And yes, we were scheduled to drill one season, I believe 2017. And we were denied permission in the last minute because of an amphibian issue. And over the following year, as they cleared out the environmental issue, the family that owned the, the, um, the campground decided not to grant access. So this was a shock. They had been the original family when the Mokras borehole was first drilled in 1967 and 68. But this is the hazards of doing drilling is getting permitting and getting money and getting the mesh at the exact same time is a very frustrating process. And it takes many years often to make the two come together. So I'm glad that you picked up the mantle of doing that. Well, so far, so good. We'll, we'll, we'll have to get funded and see. Any other questions out there? Um, feel free to chime in. Yes, Mark. All right. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, I appreciate you doing us. This. this is this fun and right on schedule here. Uh, we do a little bit of science on a Wednesday morning, and we're going to continue to do this through the summer. So. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, we'll be getting the videos uh, processed by Matt Drews and eventually put up for everybody to look at. Thank you, Ken. Have a great one.